pleasure to finally introduce to you our uh, guest lecturer, Professor Emily Brady. Um, as well as being a professor of philosophy, uh, Emily Brady holds the Suzanne M. and Milburn G. Glasscock Director's Chair in the Glasscock Center for Humanities Research at Texas A&M. Uh, before, she was professor of environment and philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, professor Brady's research and teaching interests span aesthetics and philosophy of art, environmental ethics, 18th century philosophy, environmental humanities, and animal studies. Um, uh, her philosophical approach moves between the historical and contemporary, seeking to interpret past thinking about nature, uh, environment, and the arts for a contemporary context. Uh, in current research, she explores interactions between um, aesthetics and ethics, specifically through other regarding attitudes towards the natural world. Uh, for instance, forms of aesthetic attention, wonder, humility, natural beauty and the sublime. In early work, uh, she focused on uh, the place of imagination, perception, and emotion in aesthetic experience of the environment. She has published a number of books, but among them we can recall Aesthetics of the Natural Environment, uh, appeared with Edinburgh University Press, then The Sublime in uh, Modern Philosophy, appear, appeared with Cambridge University Press, and then the most recent one, Between Nature and Culture, the Aesthetics of Modified Environments that she uh, co-authored with Isis Brooke and Jonathan Pryor. Uh, Emily Brady is a past president and vice president of the International Society for Environmental Ethics and has served on the executive committee of the Royal Institute of Philosophy and the British Society of Aesthetics, as well as having been a trustee of the American Society of Aesthetics. Currently, she serves on the advisory board of the Center for Animal Ethics and editorial boards of environmental ethics and ethics policy and environment. So without further ado, uh, let's now hear Professor Brady's lecture titled Aesthetics and Environment, The Big Question. So thanks again for being here today. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm so pleased to have been invited to speak to Dr. Ian Neely's class and uh, also to Mantova Architectura. Uh, it's really an honor and uh, good to uh, see everybody as it were <laughs> through, through this meeting. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this lecture is, is going to be a, a kind of introduction to environmental aesthetics, but I'm going to do it through what I see to be some of the big questions of the field. And um, that will take us uh, through, through the lecture. So what are those big questions? Well, first thing I want to say is that I'm a philosopher. Uh, that's my main discipline, but I do consider myself an interdisciplinary philosopher. I spent many years among critical human geographers and also among physical geographers uh, in my previous position when I was in uh, Scotland. Um, uh, but just keep in mind that my discipline is philosophy, so I'll be coming at it from, from that perspective mainly. So the first question, a really, really important one, which really got the field going is what is environmental aesthetics and how is it distinctive compared to artistic aesthetics? You know, what makes, what makes it a different field or subfield in aesthetics? Uh, because the philosophy uh, of art has really dominated uh, aesthetics for, for a very, very long time. And it still tends to be the main way in which aesthetic philosophers uh, study um, questions of uh, beauty, um, questions of uh, the different genres of the arts, uh, particular questions about representation and so on. But environmental aesthetics has emerged uh, as an important uh, subfield as well as everyday aesthetics. The second question that I'm going to be looking at is how do aesthetic values interact with, us, with ethical values? And what is exactly a re the relationship that we can see between environmental aesthetics and environmental ethics. And thirdly, in terms of thinking about where the field is going and what some of the important questions are that should be driving it, I'm asking with, with this, uh, you know, in the context of the disastrous effects of global climate change and finding ourselves in the new uh, declared geological age of the Anthropocene, what is the significance of developing intergenerational thinking? and intergenerational questions and issues within environmental aesthetics, or indeed within aesthetics more generally. 
because I do think that the climate emergency uh, is something that all uh, aesthetic philosophers should be looking at, not just uh, those of us working in the smaller field of environmental aesthetics. So starting with the first big question, what is environmental aesthetics? Well, I'd like to give an overview of some of the key ideas. It emerged as a subfield in aesthetics, again, within in philosophy in the late 1960s. Many people uh, argue that Ronald Hepburn's uh, seminal article in the late 1960s, um, Contemporary Aesthetics and the Neglect of Natural Beauty was really a marker for, for the field really getting underway. And of course here, I should let you know that the context in which I'm discussing this is the UK and Europe and also North America. That is the context in which I'm discussing this field of environmental aesthetics. And it may seem obvious, but it's a really, really important part of understanding environmental aesthetics that the environment is the central uh, thing that's studied. And of course, it's not a thing. It's many environments, it's many places, it's many landscape, landscapes globally. It's natural items, it's modified environments, gardens, parks, rural environments, perhaps nature in the city. Uh, it's wild nature and whatever we mean by that, and that's a tricky question. So the environment is what, uh, as it were, presents the data of environmental aesthetics. And that's very important because it shapes this key idea that experience and appreciation of environment from an aesthetic point of view is not principally guided by artistic conventions or framings. Uh, the art history, uh, knowledge of different artistic genres, different kinds of arts, and many new forms of art are really, that's the knowledge that grounds and informs our artistic judgments and the work of art critics and the work of art historians and also everyday appreciators who are going to art uh, galleries and so on. When it comes to the environment, uh, uh, philosophers have had to think about, you know, what is it that's distinctive about environmental appreciation in contrast to artistic appreciation? One thing uh, is that environments present multi-sensory and immersive possibilities. And I'll say more about that in a moment. There are many art forms which enable us to have multi-sensory and immersive experiences. Installation artworks. Of course, many architectural spaces allow for an immersive experience and different atmospheres. Um, but the kind of immersion in the environment is an immersion not in an, uh, within an artifactual setting, but within a largely natural setting, uh, surrounded by uh, natural um, ecologies, um, by different kinds of animals, plants, insects, and so on. Everything that makes up the natural world, including the sky, <laughs> including uh, the seas and oceans, and so on. And environments are also uh, dynamic and changing. And we can find dynamic um, uh, features in works of art, in music, in film, uh, for example. But in environments, again, that, dy that dynamism and that change is really coming from natural forces. What are those forces? Well, um, uh, weather is perhaps one of the most obvious ones, changing weather patterns, a storm coming through, rain starting and stopping, sun coming through the clouds and uh, fog and the way in which that creates a particular atmosphere in the landscape or in the city indeed. And change, change can be in short, uh, short time frames, but also longer time frames. Uh, so we could talk about seasonal changes, winter, spring, summer, autumn. We can talk about the transients. Uh, Japanese aesthetics often talks about transients as a key feature of natural beauty. Uh, for example, the transients of cherry blossoms uh, at once beautiful on the tree and then floating off the tree as they are shed from the tree. That kind of transience and change really central to environmental appreciation. We can also talk about longer term changes, deep time and geological change. We can talk about geological aesthetics and that gets us toward thinking more intergenerationally with our aesthetic ideas and theories. And last but not at all least, 
trying to understand the ways in which aesthetic values and aesthetic valuing of the natural world is a non-instrumental value. And by that, we are talking about valuing nature and environment on their own terms. You may have heard the expression, I'm not sure what it is in Italian, art for art's sake. And when we turn to the environment, we're thinking a lot about what is it to appreciate uh, and value aesthetic qualities in, of the environment in and for themselves, for their own sake, not about what they can give me. They may give me pleasure, but it's uh, for the uh, many philosophers, it's not about going out and seeking that and looking to get something back. It's about an appreciation that is outward looking and sympathetic, a kind of sympathetic aesthetic attention. Uh, and, and aesthetics is really about the senses, but it's also about emotion and knowledge and imagination, creativity, different kinds of meanings. And looking at this lovely photograph by one of my colleagues, uh, chestnut headed bee eater. If we were fortunate enough to live in, in India or in, uh, travel through India, this bee eater, we may hear it singing. We may see its lovely colors and its uh, form. Um, and, and for us, you know, that, that is an aesthetic experience. And it may be a transient experience. The bee eater may, may be there for a few moments and then fly away. Or part, perhaps it's, if we live there, part of our everyday experience, which would, would uh, be quite joyful, wouldn't it? So one of the really important starting points for environmental aesthetics has been moving beyond the scenery model. And this is important for different reasons, uh, not least because it helps us to understand how this field articulates uh, environment as central to aesthetic appreciation. And uh, we really do have something like the legacy of the picturesque, a kind of scenery model that still dictates a lot of policy making and a lot of planning when it comes to landscape and environment. And that scenery model is really a kind of distanced aesthetic appreciation. Where we, where we perceive landscape as if it were a scene, almost as if it were a picture. Hmm. And uh, this is a legacy of the 18th and uh, 19th century uh, European, uh, British, and to some extent North American landscape tastes. Um, picturesque theory and practice, there were different kinds of practices, garden design, uh, also um, design related to um, the great uh, kind of mansions or great uh, old houses in parts of Britain. Uh, but it was also a form of tourism. And uh, to the left here, we have a Claude Glass. I'm not sure if you will have heard about it before, but it is named after the painter Claude Lorrain. And there were various painters who did influence the picturesque movement, others such as Salvatore Rosa, for example. But uh, the use of this device, the Claude Glass, would place the perceiver, the appreciator, with their back to the landscape. And they would hold the device up. I'm just going to use a little mirror of my own. They would hold the device up and they would um, look at this small device and what would be captured in a tinted convex mirror of the Claude glass was a little kind of instant painting uh, reflected into um, the mirror. In other words, the landscape would appear in the mirror and there's a little patina on the cloud cloud glass. So it looks as if it's a kind of older painting. So the landscape captured in the cloud glass, but note that these appreciator has their back to the landscape. So they're really only trying to capture the landscape as if it were a two-dimensional painting. And what that means uh, is a, a very limited kind of appreciation, uh, one that is uh, uh, really on uh, arts terms and uh, one that is on, on humans ter human terms, a very artifactually driven appreciation, driven by, by an interest in the arts. It's also a very a limited and fairly narrow uh, kind of appreciation because it only captures the visual qualities of environment or landscape. Of course, it's a type of appreciation that um, uh, did enable people to go out into environments and landscapes and, and often appreciate them for the very first time. So I don't want to say that the picturesque doesn't have uh, some important um, role to play in the evolution of landscape tastes, but it does offer a kind of limited view. And it has also given uh, 
uh, us this, this scenery model, uh, which again endures today. Um, and so really environmental aesthetics ha had, had that first challenge to address, which is to get past the scenery model. Also an important point is that if you stick only to the scenery model, you leave out a whole set of aesthetic values and disvalues that might not relate to the picturesque, the pretty, the beautiful, the pastoral, and so on. Uh, we need to think about quote unquote, unscenic landscapes, or as Yuriko Saito has called them, scenically challenged landscapes. Wetlands, bogs, um, other kinds of uh, less, less obviously attractive landscapes, which of course would still have uh, their, their own beauty. So what is distinctive about environmental aesthetics in terms of this idea of immersion and multi-sensory experience? Well, it is a kind of engagement, a going into environment, a situatedness, being situated within, not without or from the outside. And Arnold Berliant, a prominent figure in uh, uh, environmental aesthetics puts it this way. He says, perceiving environment from within, as it were, looking not at it, but in it. Nature becomes something then quite different. It is transformed into a realm in which we live as participants, not observers. The aesthetic mark of all such times is not disinterested contemplation, but total engagement, a sensory immersion in the natural world that reaches the still uncommon experience of unity. Because I wanted to say something about this photograph, which I took some years ago in Iceland. This is one of my students. And look at how he's getting right down into this small gorge. Now, this is a basalt geology, very common in parts of Iceland, getting right down in there, experiencing the kind of ancient geology of Iceland, probably uh, feeling this tactile sensation of the rocks, smelling the water and the mosses there at that wet bottom, uh, and of course all the visual qualities of the place. This is the immersed aesthetic experience. So how has the field developed? Well, today I think it's safe to say that we have two categories of different theories, and they are competing uh, theories. On the one hand, we have scientific cognitivism, and on the other, we have scientific, uh, on the one hand, scientific cognitivism, and, in, and the other, non-cognitivism. And these terms that are used to describe these different theories have their own meanings within uh, philosophical aesthetics. Uh, they, environmental aesthetics, they, they aren't being used, um, they aren't being drawn really from other fields of philosophy. They have their own particular usage. With scientific cognitivism, uh, Alan Carlson is the main figure and has been very influential in the field. He's a Canadian philosopher, and he developed the natural environmental model uh, as a response to the scenery model. And he argues for, again, the senses as the starting point of our aesthetic experiences, just as many other philosophers would. But he also tries to understand how knowledge plays a role because he thinks that knowledge is important. He wants to argue that aesthetic judgments and appreciation are informed by scientific knowledge and natural history. And this provides a kind of appropriate grounding or objective uh, grounding. So in the absence of artistic conventions, artistic knowledge, we have natural history and scientific knowledge because uh, in his view, he argues that these are the most appropriate forms and frames of knowledge to bring into uh, our aesthetic appreciation. Because when we turn to the environment, we no longer have those artistic conventions which might guide our judgments and our appreciation. It is also notable that eco-aesthetics has emerged uh, in China in particular, and this combines both Western and Chinese philosophical traditions. Now, non-cognitive theories are generally more pluralistic. They are in particular interested in, in a broader way of articulating the grounds uh, and aspects of aesthetic appreciation uh, that are important. 
And Ar Arnold Berlian's aesthetics of engagement, um, I think you saw the quote from the last slide, which is really uh, encapsulates his approach, engaging with environment from within, being immersed, not distanced perception or a disinterested standpoint. And he is uh, indeed, his position is often contrasted with Alan Carlson's. Now with non-cognitive theories, subjectivity is embraced to some extent. Objectivity in aesthetic judgments is what Alan Carlson is concerned with, and I'll say more about that later. But subjectivity and intersubjectivity become more important uh, in relation to um, non-cognitivism. Uh, situated, not detached, not distanced, and also context matters. Pluralistic, as I mentioned, uh, it's not just the senses and some kinds of knowledge, but also imagination and emotion being both extremely important to shaping our aesthetic appreciation, our judgments, how we find meaning in the environment. And I just list a few figures who um, fall into this category uh, of aesthetic theories of environment. Ronald Hepburn, Yuriko Saito, I have a question mark. Sometimes she's placed on the other side, uh, maybe somewhere in between. Uh, Noel Carroll and myself as well. Scientific cognitivism. Well, um, I'll just read the quote and say a little bit more about it. If to aesthetically appreciate art, we must have knowledge of artistic traditions and styles within those traditions, to aesthetically appreciate nature, we must have knowledge of the different environments of nature and of the, of the systems and elements within those environments. In the way in which art critics and the art historians are well equipped to aesthetically appreciate art, the naturalist, the ecologist, uh, uh, and the ecologist uh, are well equipped to aesthetically appreciate nature. So this is, uh, again, encapsulates Carlson, Alan Carlson's position. He wants to say that, you know, when we move to try to understand uh, our, our aesthetic appreciation in the context of environment, how do we start to ground it, inform it, shape it, uh, frame it? Um, he doesn't want to think it could be anything goes. He's a philosopher. He's interested in uh, understanding the uh, subjectivity and objectivity of aesthetic judgments. Um, you know, these are, these are important to his argument. Well, for one thing, he thinks scientific knowledge can deepen and enrich our aesthetic experiences. But he also thinks, it, thinks that it helps us to get things right. So let's think about the arts for a moment, okay? Think about a Picasso painting, the Spanish artist. He was a, a champion of cubism. Now, if you were to go into an art gallery and know nothing about cubism, and you came upon a Picasso, you might think it was a very odd and awful, terrible painting if you knew nothing about cubism, if you knew nothing about what he was trying to do, even some basic knowledge, okay? Even from the little information uh, that's beside the painting. So you have some kind of way of understanding Picasso's unusual or new uh, style. So what happens when you turn to the natural environment? you don't have necessarily lots of knowledge. You have some common sense knowledge, perhaps. Carlson seems to think you need a bit more than common sense knowledge. And I have an image here of a, a beautiful beluga whale. It's a kind of unusual looking creature, isn't it? Um, but the beluga whale is, um, uh, many species of whales, they are mammals. And uh, Carlson uses an example in one of his writings to say that this is a really important example uh, to think about whales as mammals. Because if we were to think of them as fish, we might think, hmm, they're kind of awkward and cumbersome fish. They don't really move through the ocean in the amazing way that, you know, uh, schools of fish move and, you know, the silvery movement. If we understand a whale as a mammal, we think, wow. This is an incredible uh, mammal. It is huge and it moves with grace uh, in its own territory, the, great, uh, the oceans and the seas. So that understanding of, of what kind of thing this creature is um, uh, helps us to aesthetically appreciate it in an appropriate way. Now, non-cognitivism is more pluralistic. 
And some of the criticisms of cognitivism, of scientific cognitivism, have come from this direction, have come from the direction of saying, it's maybe too high a bar or too high a standard to sort of expect that people have lots of knowledge of natural history, more than perhaps what might be considered common sense. And what is common sense knowledge anyway? So really, uh, non-cognitivists have said, well, let's <clears throat> be more pluralistic for one thing about the kinds of knowledge that are important to guiding, informing, grounding aesthetic appreciation. Let's talk about non-expert and local knowledge of places, places which becomes really, inter uh, really interesting and really important when it comes to planning, uh, when it comes to protecting local places that people do not want to go away or be developed. That non-expert and local knowledge has so much to offer. Also indigenous forms of knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, Embracing these a, a more pluralistic range of knowledges uh, certainly can and, um, make our, our, uh, our, our theory of aesthetic uh, uh, environmental appreciation more democratic, more pluralistic, more embracing, more broad. And I have simply a, a, a nice uh, cover image of uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, an indigenous person and, and also a, a botanist and a scientist who combines um, these knowledges in her incredible uh, understanding of plants. She also writes uh, for more popular audiences and this is one of her most well-known books, Braiding Sweetgrass. I certainly recommend it. Note too that stories, narratives, folklore and imagination the arts as well will certainly uh, come into the ways in which we find meaning, uh, meanings through our aesthetic experiences of environment and place. I'd like to say something about emotions because I think they also play a role and this uh, links to planning and, and uh, development as well. Rista Lotvinen, uh, a resident of Huvinka in Finland, um, they do lots of environmental aesthetics in Finland. It's a great champion of the field Pauline von Bonstorff quoted him in one of her uh, previous articles back in the 90s. He says, you should never plan a road if you haven't visited the place many times. It is not enough to go there once. You should go in different moods. You should go when you're drunk <laughs> and try the feeling of how it is to sing in the forest. You should go the following day when you have a hangover. You should go when your heart is broken. Then perhaps you know if you can build that road or not. Here we see how uh, local knowledge, non-expert knowledge, how the emotions of somebody who loves their forest and is very attached to that place can speak to all of its qualities, aesthetic qualities and otherwise. So the emotions as an important, though more subjective and personal part of the aesthetic experience. I'd like to move on now to our second question. Another really big and important question uh, that environmental aesthetics uh, has been thinking about and is thinking about much more than it used to. What is the relationship between environmental aesthetics and environmental ethics? Well, a key question is this. This is really the question I think that has driven a lot of the work already. And that is, if I find some environment, ecosystem, landscape, part of nature to be beautiful, will I then be inclined to care for and protect that environment or landscape or part of nature? Now, many philosophers think that the answer to this question is yes. They think that our aesthetic values, that our aesthetic appreciation can, and the ways in which we meaningfully interact with the environment can support our environmental actions environmental activism, environmental responsibilities. Now there are um, different ways of, of trying to think about this, um, but essentially um, the starting point is this, that our, our valuing of the environment can support an ethical attitude toward environment. And this is how we get that link. It's not, an, for the philosophers here, or thinking philosophically, uh, it's not a necessary connection just because I find something beautiful, it doesn't mean that I will want to care for it. But there is a, a kind of encouragement, a motivation perhaps. The different ways in which philosophers have tried to support this argument and this claim 
really fall into, I think, one central idea, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll look at this in more detail in a moment. It's about valuing nature on its own terms and respect for nature and how this is incorporated into the aesthetic experience and appreciation. And I have a polar bear image there uh, for a reason. Polar bears are um, uh, incredible, majestic animals. They are also predators. They are also endangered. They are losing their sea ice due to global climate change. Um, and they have become the poster child of climate change for better or for worse. Sometimes they are anthropomorphized, uh, not realizing that they are predators. They can be dangerous to other animals, prey animals, and also to human beings. So what is it to aesthetically appreciate a polar bear in a way that's valuing that, that polar bear on its own terms? Well, here are some ways in which philosophers have thought about this. Now we've looked at a couple of them already, not framing nature via art, not aestheticizing nature, not using the lens of art. Of course, art can help us, poetry and poets in the way that they write so passionately about the natural world. Um, but to only uh, view environment through the arts would be really uh, an impoverished and narrow way and would not appreciate nature uh, on its own terms, but really on human terms. Scientific cognitivism, does also try to find ways in which uh, we can appreciate nature on its own terms. And it does that largely through natural history, through using scientific knowledge to guide our judgments, making sure that we make judgments in an appropriate and not uh, misinformed or um, uh, other, other way, and you know, kind of anthropomorphizing that could be a sort of pervert our, our appreciation in some way. Generally decentering the human in aesthetic appreciation of nature. I want to tell you that uh, most philosophers working in environmental aesthetics do not consider our aesthetic judgments of environment to be anthropocentric, but they do consider them to be anthropogenic. And that's to say that aesthetic judgments of nature are non-instrumentally uh, made. They are valuing things for their own sake. That takes the human out that decenters the human. That means that uh, it's a more non-anthropocentric non perspective. But aesthetic judgments are anthropogenic, which is to say they are generated by humans. They do come from a human perspective. Whether other animals can make aesthetic judgments is a, another question altogether, but there are some writers who have looked at that. On the non-cognitive side of things, People like Ronald Hepburn have talked a lot about how important it is not to trivialize or sentimentalize nature, to ensure that our aesthetic appreciation is serious, not trivial. And I'll say something in a moment about participatory aesthetics and ecological citizenship. And I have this amazing photograph by Jurgen Ross, a carcass eye view, which uh, was a runner up in uh, the world, uh, worldwide uh, photography competition some years ago. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, really, I think, uh, driving home this, you know, conflict, you know, this is a beautiful photograph, but look at the subject matter. This is a predator-prey relationship. This is a lion eating a carcass, you know, so this is a tragic moment for the prey, the dead animal, uh, but a great moment for the lion who is being fed. Part of the uh, uh, question of how environmental aesthetics may or may not support environmental ethics comes down to thinking about and recognizing the variety of aesthetic values. The term aesthetic does not just mean beauty when you look in the dictionary, it also means having to do with the senses. And that is really the way in which environmental aesthetics uses the term aesthetics. It is about the senses, a sensory engagement with environment. So there are a whole range of aesthetic appreciations and appreciations which involve disvalue of the ugly, of the disgusting, of things that threaten and frighten us, of snakes, of bats, of insects, um, of storms, of all kinds of things uh, that are not uh, in, in some way um, uh, conventionally attractive. So how do we address that? Because uh, that means that our aesthetic responses will conflict rather than harmonize with our ethics. 
Well, uh, Sheila Lintott has argued that environmental education can help us to overcome our biases and our fears, and that can lead to environmental protection. So that's the way in which aesthetics can be supplemented or informed uh, when it's otherwise uh, somehow to bias. Sometimes we'll never get over our biases. That's okay too, <laughs> because there are just some things that are dangerous and it's uh, you know, impossible for us to enter into any kind of aesthetic appreciation. I have here a really interesting case study, which Sheila Lintott uh, has discussed uh, and is now uh, kind of relatively local to me, only a couple hours away. Um, in Austin, Texas, many years ago, um, uh, Mexican free-tailed bats uh, began to roost and to, uh, to migrate and to use um, this bridge uh, uh, for roosting and for uh, breeding. And it was, a, I understand, because of the construction, the new changes in construction of the bridge, which allowed particular kinds of um, uh, spacings in the architecture of the bridge, the design of the bridge, uh, which was really uh, bat friendly, even though that was not intentional. Okay, so the bats moved in and the people of Austin were not happy about that. They didn't like the smell. A lot of people are frightened of bats. And so there was a lot of negative um, uh, reactions to the bats. A lot of uh, uh, people wanted to have them removed. Uh, but a wildlife biologist uh, really championed the cause and, uh, of environmental education. And over the years, and uh, the city as well, with a lot of work by the city, um, public discourse is now totally in favor of the bats. People love them. I'm sure there are exceptions, but, and that has meant that these uh, bats are protected. They're also now a tourist attraction, which Austin loves to, uh, Austin, Texas loves to, uh, to talk about. <laughs> so they have really, uh, they have really become something else, um, a real tourist attraction. But that's a story about how uh, our aesthetic appreciation can be, can be changed and can be shaped uh, uh, through environmental education. And there are other ways in which we can shape our environmental appreciation in order to um, uh, create more meaningful human nature relationships uh, through participating in environmental projects which engage us and enable us to see how we've harmed the environment, paying a lot of attention to degraded environments, uh, the ways in which we've damaged environments and how that can educate us and see some of the aesthetic losses uh, and the ways those aesthetic losses can be turned around with the arrival of new species, for example, when we've restored a place. Okay, so I'd like to finish with this third question. What is the significance of developing an intergenerational environmental aesthetics? Because with this, what I'm doing is really trying to, this big question is, how do we move the field forward? What are some of the really big issues that we need to address uh, in the field of environmental aesthetics. I actually think that this question also applies to the field of aesthetics more generally. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that, not least uh, the climate emergency. So we know that global climate change is an intergenerational problem. It spans present and future generations of humans and non-humans. It's also, as scientists describe it, a severely time-lagged phenomenon. Scientific evidence draws on data from the past to indicate current impacts, which we know we are already seeing, near future impacts, as well as much longer term in impacts uh, to 100 years, and uh, I think maybe even further now. So aesthetics really needs to think about what, what, what are the implications of this for landscape and environment, for not just our generation, but our children and their children and so on. That means thinking intergenerationally in an aesthetic context. We need to think about time. We need to think about a future aesthetics and what that might look like as we develop our theories and ideas and move the field forward. And this would simply be to parallel developments in philosophy, such as climate ethics and climate justice. I have here a sequoia tree from Yosemite because it really, to me, uh, is almost a symbol of intergenerational uh, thinking, intergenerational experience and aesthetics in the natural world. These magnificent trees span generations of human beings, uh, span generations of indigenous and settler peoples, and um, they are really magnificent. And here an image of closer to home, home certainly for all of you, uh, Venice. 
In aesthetic terms, uh, you know, what kind of world will we be left with? Um, or will, will we be rather leaving to future generations in light of the catastrophic effects of climate breakdown? What world will we, will we be leaving to them in an aesthetic sense? You know, you might say, why does this really matter? There are many more important questions and issues we need to deal with climate change. But you know, I don't really think that's the way to think about aesthetics. I don't think aesthetics is trivial. I don't think it's the icing on the cake, that which you think about, you know, after everything else. I think of aesthetics as integral to the flourishing of human lives. And I think that aesthetics can also support the flourishing of non-human lives. For that reason, I think it's important for us to think about this question. So, you know, more specifically, how will losses affecting people in nature also become losses in aesthetic values? How will the loss of island and coastal landscapes, those, those places that many people call home, how will they be changed, aesthetically speaking? And when we, we already know we have mass extinctions going on, of various animal and plant and insect species, you know, how will the loss of those species affects, affect not only ecology, but also aesthetic qualities within those ecologies? Might these aesthetic losses contribute to our ecological grief? And how will that happen? Ecological grief is a concept that's being discussed across many different disciplines today. Where does aesthetics fit in there? And how can the arts and architecture engage society with the climate emergency? I'm sure that uh, many architects are already thinking about that. Uh, you know, ecological architecture has a long history now. I noticed that uh, the Venice Biennale, uh, their architecture pavilion in 2021 is zero carbon emissions pavilion. You know, so there are lots of ways in which people are thinking about a climate change in relation to architecture. I am curious, um, and maybe this is something that might come up in discussion, how given uh, Mantua, and it's uh, historical architecture, how uh, people are thinking about um, climate change in relation to preservation. Certainly there are many ideas that are gonna be generated in the context of flooding uh, in Venice. And I, I wonder what that means also in, in Mantua. So I wanna just finish uh, with this slide um, because I don't wanna leave the arts out of environmental aesthetics. There's been lots written about the arts in environmental aesthetics too. And um, this is an interesting uh, 2020 installation uh, by Olafur Eliasson, the Danish Icelandic artist, uh, which is on the mountaintop, on the mountaintop in South Tyrol in, uh, in your country of Italy. And um, I'm just gonna read from, from the artist's website. By marking the horizon, the cardinal directions and the movement of the sun, the artwork directs the visitor's attention to a larger planetary perspective on the changes in climate that are directly affecting the Hochjochferner glacier. The artwork, Olafur Eliasson has said, acts as a magnifier for the very particular experience of time and space that this location affords, vast and boundless on the one hand, local and specific on the other. It is an optical device that invi invites us to engage from our embodied position with planetor, planetary and glacial perspectives. I like this artwork uh, because I think it expresses intergenerational thinking. It expresses uh, the problem of, um, of uh, ice loss, of glacial, glacial loss, which is creating all sorts of changes in the Earth systems, uh, uh, not least uh, sea level rise, which is a really serious concern as our uh, Arctic uh, melts. And um, uh, it also connects us to future generations, uh, thinking about how that ice loss is changing our Earth systems and what that's going to mean for our children and their children. It also connects us uh, in a planetary way. It makes us think globally. Global climate change moves us from the local to the global. And also, I think it's a cosmological artwork. It gets us to think beyond ourselves, our puny, small, insignificant selves, and to think about our place in the universe, and to think about, uh, philosophically speaking, where we are. You know, it makes us think uh, in anthropocene, anthropocene terms, which is to say, to make us feel 
although we have now affected all systems in the earth in one way or another, perhaps it helps to draw us back from that and to draw us back from hubris, uh, from anthropocentrism and helps us to understand really how insignificant we are in all of this. I'll just uh, end with that, a lovely piece of uh, habitat architecture in London, in the London Wetlands Center, which is uh, in the city of London, uh, a bat house uh, created by um, uh, architects. There's uh, interesting work on a habitat architecture now that you, you may be well aware of. Thank you very much for this amazing and insightful overview and uh, of environmental aesthetics, but also thanks for sharing with us your very own perspective and uh, bringing the question precisely to our most recent contemporaneity with uh, the question of inter intergenerational thinking applied to, uh, to environmental aesthetics. So thank you very much for for participating in a month of architecture.